So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, for joining us at today's presentation by Mr. Gersent. This is sort of a, a series that combines um, European politics and European economics. We've had presentations already by the President of the Court of Auditors, by uh, um, various uh, other worthies. Uh, we will have presentations by the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank, Sharon Donnery, and also by Bruno Le Maire, the French Finance Minister, very shortly. So you can see that the IIA is trying to present to, uh, to all of its members a, a really well-rounded view of what's happening in Europe, in economics, in finance, um, in a way that uh, has so far turned out to be uh, really quite accessible. The rule of the day is that Mr. Gersent will speak, and that's a recorded conversation, um, but that when we get to a discussion afterwards, it's Chatham House rules, which means you may, of course, discuss the information, but on a non-attributable basis. And that <coughs> is not to be non-transparent, it's just to allow people the chance to speak without having to organise their thoughts in a, uh, overly organise exactly what they say in exactly the right uh, form of words. Um, I think we will have a very good conversation. Let me briefly say that Mr. Gersent is the dir Director General of what, of, of the Directorate General in the EU, which controls things like the ca Banking Union, the Capital Markets Union, and so forth. For those of you who don't know, in the European system, <coughs> legislation is uh, proposed by the Commission. So the Parliament, the Council are very much involved, of course, they may suggest that legislation be might be required, but the drafting, the architecture of the legislation, uh, the architecture of the regulatory system comes from the Commission. So we have with us today, in effect, the chief architect of the European, of, of the ongoing changes in the European financial regulatory legislative system. It's a great privilege, therefore, to. Uh, have, have the chance to hear what's being said. I think probably because of historical reasons we are all very focused on banks still in Ireland, but uh, there are many people in the room have, who are uh, in non-banks or who service uh, well beyond, the, who provide services well beyond the banking area into other parts of the financial system, and therefore your, your, uh, your views on the capital market union and how it might progress and also on sustainable finance and so forth will be, will be very interesting to us. So thank you very much. I'll allow you to Far away. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, yes, I, I had planned today to, to center my remarks on, on two topics that are future-oriented, and which are innovation and sustainable finance. Um, we can also discuss all the rest uh, uh, in the question time. <clears throat> um, it, it's not because there are, I mean, there are a number of other things that are important. I mean, we need to finish banking union rather sooner than later. We need to put in place a, a true capital market union for many reasons. Uh, the first one being that uh, because we've been regulating the, the banks, uh, the uh, ability of the banks to deliver much more financing to the economy than what they are delivering now uh, is limited uh, because their leverage is more limited than it used to be. Uh, I remember instantly when I when I uh, took over as head of staff of Mr. Barnier almost 10 years ago, uh, which, uh, which is when we started the, the journey towards uh, revamping the whole regulatory framework in the, in the European Union. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we were working on the, on the first steps of, uh, of uh, CRD4, so the new Basel III framework. Um, and I was discussing with friends of mine that had been studying finance a very long time ago, because I'm very old, so like 30 years ago. Uh, uh, and I was telling them uh, that in uh, CRD4, so in the Basel 3, the maximum leverage is 3, so 1 to 33, in effect. And I was saying, wow, that much? No, no, this, we reduced it to 1 to 33. Because that's true that in the good old days, in the 80s, when I was studying finance, when you had a leverage of 1 to 10, 1 to 50, you said, whoa. So, I mean, that, that, that explains something. And the leverages pre-crisis had, had, had gone very, very high 
and uh, it was actually urgent to to bring them down and a couple of other things. But the result of all this is, of course, the ability of the banking system, all things equal, to provide more financing to the economy is therefore limited on the grounds of safety. And so the first reason why we need a capital market union is because, therefore, we need non-banking finance to complement that, uh, that banking financing. We do not need less banking financing, we need more banking financing. This will need more non-banking financing. And it's certainly not here in, in, in Ireland that I need to convince people about that, because you're one of the few member states uh, that has a, a, a real expertise in that, in that field. The second reason why we need a capital market union, so a well-functioning single market for capital, if you prefer, is, uh, is not so much quantitative, it's qualitative. And that is that not all of uh, the industry needs are best served by, by bank services. And everybody, every company needs a bank, but if you're a small spin-off of a university active in biotech, you need risk capital. And that's something your bank cannot provide to you. Well, certainly, even less in continental Europe, even in, uh, in uh, member states in which access to finance is very easy, it's still, it's still a challenge to get access to equity. Well, it's very easy to get access to loans. And this is, of course, uh, favoured by uh, uh, the, uh, the tax buyers uh, towards, uh, towards loans. But not only, uh, this is also by, because we are a heavily bank-dominated system, uh, in continental Europe over 70%, and uh, that in that bank-dominated system it's very difficult for non-banks to get access to the information you need to have if you want to effectively and actually economically serve the market. That's one of the issues we have. So the second issue is an issue of uh, basically qualitative adequacy. Uh, if we don't want or more promising companies in terms of growth of, growth of job and innovation, and innovation I come, will come to this in terms of financial services, but innovation is where really is the battlefield of the world competition. This is where we will lose or win the battle. This is where we will keep on being at the big table or relegated to the, in, the back, in the back seats. Um, but that would mean that, yes, we need to continue to finance research. Yes, we need to do a number of things that we're already doing. But at some point, we need to be able to provide our most promising companies with the type of financing they need, the, good, the right financing mix, so that they don't have to cross the Atlantic to find it. It's just that's a, as simple as that. And that's a, that is a very, very big challenge. And the third reason why we need a capital market union is that uh, it is very obvious that from a political point of view there is a limit to the willingness of uh, member states to accommodate or to cover for large asymmetric shocks in the Eurozone. And you may understand this. There's been some of the impression they will be always the one signing the check. Uh, and of course, uh, <clears throat> private sharing is a lot more effective and bigger, actually, than any measure of public transfers. Um, so the best thing that could happen for the stability of the Eurozone is that there is more German investor investing in Italy, investing in Greece, etc., etc. But for this, you need to have <coughs> effective means to select the business opportunities, benchmark, make your choice, etc. This doesn't exist. So there are a number of intermediations that are broken, needs to be restored, and this is what capital market union is about. And that's why, although the names are similar, it's a project the nature of which is completely different from banking union. Because it's about trying to see where are the problems, where are the market failures, where the, the, the market intermediation doesn't happen, why, and try to restore the incentives so that it happens again. Once you have done this, then the market needs to understand it and sort of colonize this structure and make it work. So that's complicated, that has multiple of, uh, aspects, and that will take a long time. And that's why it's a bit more difficult to get the politicians to, to be so excited. I mean, they all praise capital market union is great, but when you come to the actual hard things, 
the hundreds of small things you need to do, then uh, they, they lose a bit of uh, their interest, <coughs> in particular because there usually are reasons why these intermediation do not happen, and that is it protects niches or it protects existing positions of national players that are not willing to give them away. So there is a tension here, uh, and that's why it's long and it's difficult. We've had some success, but uh, that's a project that will need to continue in the, la in the next commission, and probably in the one after next as well. Um, all this is about the single market at the end of the day. Uh, the single market, as our British friends are discovering, is, uh, is I mean, we always say so, oh, so big as asset. Sort of we say it without really thinking about what it means. I think what Brexit shows us more in other fields than in financial services, actually, is that this is really our biggest asset. Uh, I mean, the reason why Europe is still relevant on the world scene is, as, is because we are a single market of 500 consumers, 500 million, sorry, consumers. Uh, and uh, on all what goes together with it, on all the business opportunities in terms of growing and scale, etc. How imperfect this single market is, is as I just explained in, for, the, for the, the capital markets, for example. But still, uh, And of course, what the, what the crisis showed us is that we, there are ways of building a single market that are simply not sustainable because they are not responding to the needs of the economy. And now I mean specifically in the field of financial services. And they are actually potentially even threatening our prosperity. And that's why, I mean, all the... 50 or so regulations that have been taken since 2010 and that have actually redone the whole framework of financial services across the board was necessary. I mean, what people from the industry used to tell me is, why me? Why me? I mean, my sector was not at all involved in the crisis. And, and they were absolutely correct. Uh, but you know what? Normally, the, the, the typical answer to a crisis is to fix the root of that crisis. And, uh, and what comes next, typically as well, is that the next crisis has completely different roots. Because, of course, you have plugged that hole. Uh, so it comes from somewhere else. So what we've been trying to do, uh, <coughs> without really succeeding, because you never succeed in this type of endeavor, uh, was to actually cover not only the roots of the existing crisis, but the potential uh, other sources for the next crisis, which is why we regulated a number of activities that, in our view, uh, were not regulated in a way that allowed a sufficient risk management, although they were indeed not involved in the 2008 crisis. Um, and what we see now uh, is that all this is not enough. It's not enough for two reasons. The first one is complacency. I mean, as I said, I think the banking union was the project that needed to be decided. When member states were scared, it went very fast. As soon as it started to produce its effect of calming markets, all of a sudden it was not that urgent. Because it's never easy to make abandonments of sovereignty. It's never easy, never easy to explain, to have to explain to your people as a politician that the choices we have made collectively, notably towards the euro, involve necessarily sharing sovereignty in a number of domains, which means you're not autonomously deciding on your own as you used to be. Because that's the rule... That's exactly the same as you were living in a house and you decided to, to move into a condominium. Well, you have to discuss with the other owners. You have to agree. There are a number of things you cannot do. You cannot dig holes in the walls as you see best fit, etc. You cannot decide you will not pay your bill anymore. Um, so all these things have not really ever been explained. There is a natural reluctance to explain it. 
and uh, and therefore that stalled the process at uh, at political level. And this is what explained that the banking union is still not finished. Although I have to say, in the recent month, uh, I have the impression, and, and Michael may, may agree or disagree. I think he agrees uh, that the, the the mindset has evolved more in the last six months than in the previous three years. So. So that, that good news, or that not good news, I'm not so sure, because the reason why the mindset uh, evolved may be because politicians start to worry a little bit more than they used to do again. Growth is slowing. Um, you see that risk is building outside of the banking sector. I mean, we have been pretty much tightening the regulation of banking. In Europe, we have been tightening many other regulations, as I just said, not elsewhere or not necessarily elsewhere. Uh, and in particular, I was uh, saying over lunch that I'm, uh, I'm uh, checking with uh, great interest the evolution of uh, high-yield credits and leverage loans outside of the banking sector in other regions of the world. In particular, ever since I've read a study that explains that it has been greatly boosted by securitization. If you replace leverage loans by subprime, you you have something that should uh, remind you uh, bad memories. So, and the only thing you learn when you're a regulator is that people, if there is money at stake, people usually have a very bad memory. Um, so, but all this we need to do because our first duty is financial stability. I mean, for as much as you can, you may have a bit of additional and relatively artificial growth if you allow build the building of risk in the system. Uh, the price to pay is you have quite severe recession in the coming when the when these risks actually explode. Uh, you painfully aware in Ireland and the rest of of Europe as well. But if we want to keep our uh, a role or place on the on the world scene if we want to be able to m continue to matter next to to China and the US mainly uh, we need first to be a little bit more joined up than we are currently I have addressed this point so I don't come back on it we need also to do the right things in the right sector so there is not only the financial stability sort of repairing or or caring for for the risks aspect there is also a proactive regulation uh, developing uh, our industry in the sectors that will matter in the future. And this is what I would like to mainly talk to you about today. And I have picked two topics, which are probably you could select others, but these ones, in my view, are the uh, more emblematic one, and that is sustainable finance. <clears throat> and um, everything that has to, to do around the crossroad between <coughs> finance and innovation uh, with its threats, risks and its opportunities. If we are not able to uh, be a significant players in these two fields, we will uh, gradually matter less and less on planet finance and therefore on the planet at all. Um, and we, we have a real opportunity there. Um, we are a bit, in my view, behind the curve in innovation, uh, but we are ahead of the curve in, in, in sustainable finance. And we have a real opportunity to become the world standard setter with all the, I mean, whether they believe or not in climate change, whether they believe or not it should be mitigated, uh, even if you don't believe in it, there are short-term side benefits for the industry. Because if Europe becomes the center setter for this, uh, our industry will benefit from it. So what are we doing <clears throat> in sustainable finance? Well, first of all, let me commend Ireland. Uh, you, you have a stated ambition to become a hub for sustainable finance in Europe, which I think is good. Others have the same ambition, which I think is equally good. Uh, I've been dedicating 20 years of my life doing competition policy, so I believe uh, 
unlike most of my compatriots, that uh, usually you're more competitive when you confront yourself with others that are as uh, performing as you are, even more performing than you are, rather than uh, making races of your own alone, and therefore you win. Uh, because one day or the other, you end up meeting others, and um, then the sad reality comes to the surface. Um, so it's good that there is an, uh, a, a healthy competition between centers. Uh, that was partially prompted by Brexit. Uh, and I think the, the post-Brexit world uh, in the EU27 will probably be a world of uh, multipolar uh, financial uh, uh, centers. I don't think any of the competitors has the capacity uh, to uh, concentrate what the city has concentrated. Uh, and I don't think it is healthy either. Uh, so, but anyway, I told you about my competition background. I hate picking the winners as well. And uh, maybe one will concentrate. And that would mean uh, it's the most efficient way to do things. And, uh, and it's great. But I don't think this is what will happen. Anyway, in the area of sustainable finance, I think there is room for everybody. It's a nascent uh, business. It's a business in which uh, there are equal opportunities. Uh, Ireland is doing great things. Luxembourg is uh, trying also to do a lot of things uh, quite successfully. Paris is not staying idle. That's, all this is very good. The Dutch have a, have a keen interest for very obvious reasons. They will be flooded if it doesn't work. Um, so... All this is, is excellent. Um, what is it that we are trying to do at, uh, at uh, uh, EU level? Well, let me, let me be simple. If we want collectively, as Europe, to meet our uh, COP21 target, we need to be carbon neutral in 2050. And I can tell you, if you have spare time, read the studies about what that means. Uh, the previous industrial revolutions are peanuts compared to what is ahead of us. And if we don't make it, the consequences are potentially dreadful. Because for as long as scientists can broadly explain you how bad it will be up to three degree warming in 2100, above that, the problem is that you may start mechanisms that we have no idea what they will bring us through. Above three degrees, at some point, nobody can tell you which one. Ocean may stop absorbing carbon or be too acid. And uh, good luck to the Irish fishermen. Uh, above three degrees, permafrost will be permanently defrozen, liberating hundreds of tons of methane in the atmosphere. And methane is 12 times uh, more powerful than carbon, etc., etc., etc. So, for our own sake, we'd better have a planet that is contained below 3 degrees. And if we want to have a planet that is still nice to live in below 2, ideally below 1.5, but if you think that in the last 20 years, we didn't manage to counter a warming of one degree because we are currently at one degree higher than 30 years ago. The, our ability to limit it to an additional 0.5, if you think what it would mean in terms of the way we live, I frankly don't think will happen. I would hope it will, but I don't think it will. But anyway, if we want to be carbon neutral in 2050, only for uh, uh, energy and transport, we need to find an additional, so incremental each year, 180 billion in investment. Now, if you add a couple of other policy dimensions, you are at 300 billion incremental each year. And uh, if you include energy, uh, efficiency, renovation of buildings, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all things will, which will be needed to be done, then you're much more than that. Another way to, to say it is that there is no measurement of uh, public spending 
that can meet these targets. So we will need private funding. And that's very good because it so happens that we have over 100 trillion of assets in the EU. One of the problems is that they have a huge appetite for short term. So now you're irrespective of sustainability. And that's more of a capital market union problem. And that's also something that's difficult to understand because why is it that we save more than we have ever saved in history? And that is because we are uncertain about the future. I mean, if you, if you look at macroeconomic studies about the frequency of repetition of crisis ever since the great crisis of 1930, it's very interesting because the frequency double every 20 years. Uh, so that's, why we, that's why the first reason why we save more. The second reason why we save more is that we are an aging continent. So we save more because we know we're going to be old and we have to care for that. So in that circumstance, at least for the second reason, you should save long term. But it's difficult to explain why savings are such an appetite for short term. And it's also difficult to see how you can restore the incentive towards long term. So, but that's a capital market union issue. But long term is not enough. It needs to be long term sustainable. Uh, because otherwise we will miss, we will miss our targets. And frankly, over 100 trillion, we should be able to find 500 million to invest in long-term sustainable investment. Especially as this long-term sustainable investment, according to all studies, do not have a lesser uh, uh, yield than any other. Uh, but still, it doesn't happen. Well, we've been trying to understand why, and uh, that's the result of uh, an action plan that the Commission has adopted uh, a year ago, uh, in March uh, 2018. Uh, and we have launched the first measures uh, very soon in May, and we hope to have the first legislation still adopted in this legislature. So what is this action plan? About Well, the first issue, the first reason why there is not enough investment in long-term sustainable uh, uh, assets is that there is no common language. What you mean by sustainable is not necessarily what I mean by sustainable. If I'm a fund and I market myself on the full page in the Financial Times as sustainable, you don't actually really mean what it means. Or maybe the small part of the fund that I'm advertising is actually invested in sustainable assets, but the whole fund around is not and is maybe invested. You can, you can benchmark at how many degrees the fund is invested. So some of the funds that market themselves are green are invested at six degrees in 2100. So that's all fine. I mean, you, can, you may invest in whatever you want, but it's simply, if as an investor I have a preference, I need to have an information I can rely on. That information doesn't exist because we have no common language. So the thing we have decided to do is to create that common language. We call it a taxonomy. It's complicated. Because it's not about saying this is green and good and this is brown and bad. Others have tried this way, and it didn't work. The Chinese have tried to put in place a taxonomy that was predicated on this basis, and it didn't really work. And the reason for this is that, don't tell that to my friend in NGOs, but you shouldn't really care whether it's green or brown. What you care about is, is this investment saving emissions, and how much? Because the business we're in is to save a maximum of emissions of carbon in the next 10 years. Because if we miss that, we won't win the battle and we won't contain global warming to two, to two degrees. It's as simple as that. So, and that of course makes it more meaningful, but that makes it more complicated. So take the producers of flat glass, I mean the glass in these windows. Are they green? Usually not. They are quite brown, actually. 
Well, the trouble though is we cannot win the battle against global warming if we do not have massive plans for energy renovation. And we cannot do it if we do not have the very efficient technical glasses. So we need these guys to invest and we need them to get access to finance to invest into these products and manufacture them. Of course, we need also them to manufacture them in a less carbon-emitting way than they do, and that is also doable, but that also involves huge investments. So it's not about them being green or not green. It's about what is it that they are saving as emission, not on, first through the modification they're making in their manufacturing process, and second, through the products they are, they are selling. Uh, second example, electric cars. Are electric cars green? Depends. I don't know if you know what is the lowest emission car in the world. It's a small Hyundai with a 900cc engine that is sold only in Korea. That's not an electric car. Because when you measure uh, uh, the emission, you should measure it in the full cycle, what they call scope three. So emission of building, emission while using, emission while recycling. And when you do this, I can tell you my small Hyundai outbeats any Tesla by quite a distance. So that all depends on many things. Uh, you've probably noticed in the, in the news that there is this French-German venture to build batteries in Europe. That's interesting in many ways, but one of the ways is that if they succeed, the, these batteries for use in cars in Europe will have a carbon outlook that will be five times less than the current ones that we procure from China. So, all this is to be taken in, play, in, in question when you, when, you, when you design the taxonomy, and that's why it's technically complicated. So we have experts, which fortunately are not commission experts, uh, that, are, that are trying to disentangle all this. We are keeping member states uh, uh, aware on a weekly basis. I mean, each time we are, it's really something in which we, we need to move together. And if there is any issue, we need to clear it immediately. Uh, and then we will need to have the political discussion. And the technical discussion is difficult. The political is going to be very difficult. Nuclear. Green, not green. Definitely not green. But then if, definitely indispensable if you want to win the battle against global warming. If you dismantle today nuclear uh, produced electricity in Europe, you cannot replace it by something that doesn't that emits less carbon. So you have a net hiring of your emission. So you like it nuclear, you don't like nuclear. I don't like nuclear, but we need it at the grand juncture as a as a path towards a sustainable economy. And therefore, making it uninvestable is probably not a good idea. Coal. Green, not green, not green. But there are coal plants. So should you make uninvestable a, cap a carbon capture system in an existing coal plant? My pri private view? No. You should, you should actually encourage that investment. You should certainly discourage investment in new coal plants. But the coal plants is there. There's no way it's going to be shut down. Therefore, I prefer one with a carbon capture system than one without. So. And we will have this type of uh, political discussions, and then they have a number of uh, very deeply embedded ideas that has nothing to do with science, and that will probably stand in the way of a, of a reasonable uh, debate. But anyway, we are uh, at, the, at the, I mean, really at the front worldwide in this, in this exercise. The Chinese are interested, the, the Indians are interested, the Japanese are interested. Um, so we have a chance to, if we succeed, because it's still very challenging, to produce what could become a world standard. And we actually intend 
to offer it as a common good uh, as, as soon as we have a sufficiently robust first product. Why? Well, because I told you about the challenge we have in Europe, but you know what? Europe is 11% of total emissions. And not only is it 11% of total emissions, but it's probably the area in the world that is doing much in terms of cutting emissions. For a good and a bad reason, the good reason is that we are doing a lot of things to cut emissions, and the bad reason is that our industry is flying away to other places in which they have less constraints. Uh, so that doesn't do any good to global emissions. They simply do their emissions elsewhere in the world. Um, secondly, the bulk of the increment in emission uh, that we foresee will come, of course, from developing countries. Because the only way to develop today is to emit more gas in a carbon-dominated society. You will tell me, oh, yeah, but there are technologies to, to do otherwise. That's true, but they're a lot more expensive. That's why they're not in place here, so let alone in developing countries. So if we really want to win that battle, we need to be able to help these countries to find the financing to jump over a number of uh, technological generations and go straight to decarbonate, de decarbonated development. That's our collective interest, but that's a game theory thing. That's our collective interest. That's not necessarily the individual interest of the industry in Europe because they will immediately become a very strong competitor. So that's the type of dilemma that we will have to solve. But anyway, what the Commission has decided, we will we'll power a very, very high-level conference in uh, 21 March this year, uh, is to level up our strategy in, in sustainable finance at world level, create a platform, and offer the uh, result of our work as open source product uh, for developing countries and other international partners that are interested. So that's, that's a big, big, big challenge. And if you think about it, once you have this common language, especially if it broadens, I mean, interestingly, the largest uh, Japanese pension fund, GPIF, has announced that as soon as there is a EU taxonomy in place, they will start using it, irrespective of what Japanese authorities will do. Uh, and others are following, following uh, that, that path as well. Because that's the only way you can structure large international pools of liquidity that will be able to benchmark products on the basis of the yield, but also on the basis of the other uh, elements. That's also the only way you can develop a credible system of labels, benchmarks, indexes, etc. So this is everything that has taken. This is why uh, it matters not only for sustainability, but also as a competitive advantage for our industry, that Europe is at the, as, at the forefront. I mean, as you know, in the industry, when you're the standard setter, you usually derive a number of competitive advantages from that position. Um, so that's the plan. Uh, there are a number of other things uh, that go along with it. Clarifying the duty of asset manager and institutional investors to take sustainability into account is also the subject of one of our legislative proposals. Um, that will require financial market participants to disclose to their beneficiaries how they integrate environmental, uh, social and governance factors, the ESG factors, into their investment and advisory process. Uh, and there, I'm back to my example, uh, those investment <coughs> managers whose products are marketed as sustainable. So if you make it a marketed argument, a marketing argument, then you will have to disclose how you achieve those objectives. So in other words, you will have a general obligation of disclosure for everybody, but if you choose to say, well, I'm green, then you will have to positively prove it according to uh, the taxonomy and uh, uh, the uh, agreed method. Um, we will require insurance and investment firms to advise clients and provide suitable products on the basis of their sustainability preferences. For the time being, it's not possible. But in order to put that in place, you need to have a common language. If you don't speak the common language, 
you cannot do this. So there are a number of uh, of uh, 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 ensuing consequences of this taxonomy. And of course, I, I should mention that this this should not be seen in, a, in isolation. I mean, the, the <coughs> Europe, as I said, is at the forefront, really, of the fight against global warming. I think we are the only one that have met our targets so far, uh, and actually exceeded our target. We are the only ones that have a clear, legally binding target to reduce our emissions by a further 40% by 2030, and to become carbon neutral by 2050. If the whole of the planet would have the same, we would make it to the two degrees. Uh, but there we are talking, I mean, I told you about basically a half trillion uh, in Europe. When you go to developing countries, you can multiply it by a significant number. It's an opportunity, frankly. It's an opportunity for them, it's an opportunity for the financial industry as well. And that's the way we should, we should see it. Let me, let me go now to uh, innovation. Because that's the other big challenge in the future. And frankly, for the time being, Europe is not so well. I mean, I could see that the US, Asia are quite ahead in terms of innovation. Um, maybe because they're faster mover, maybe because they are less sensitive to the risks that are involved. I don't know, but that's, that's the point. I think one of the problems we have in Europe is if we want to be at the forefront of innovation, we need to be able to get this innovation to benefit from the single market. For the time being, because fintechs and all the rest of them are not in any framework at European level, you may develop them uh, however you want uh, within one single country, but that's it. So that's okay if that country is Germany or France, because you can acquire size within the boundaries of your country. If it's Estonia, or maybe Ireland, it might be more complicated to get the critical mass that will allow you to move towards being able to cope with the mainstream regulation national at, at European level, because you're still too small for that. And then I think it's relatively disappointing that uh, in our dealings with the national supervisors, there seems to be no appetite for something that I would have thought is, I mean, starting from first principles, very obvious, which is that they should all have a sandbox or an innovation lab. These sandboxes should all be built on the same principles, and they should be operated, uh, interoperated, uh, interoperable, sorry, and this this should be coordinated somewhere in ESMA or I don't know. Uh, because that's a question of uh, equity. I mean, if you want the innovators in small member states to have the same opportunities as in the big ones without having to move, which is, in my view, partly what Europe is about, you need to be able to build a system like this one. You need to be able to reach out of your member states from your home relatively freely. And if you want to do this in a system in which you don't go into mainstream regulation, that means you have to be able to scale up your, uh, your, 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 your sandbox. That's not where we are, and that's not where we are for many reasons, which in my view are probably cultural. If supervisors were risk takers, they would work in the private sector. Uh, I'm amazed as a regulator. I mean, very often, I will not give names. I see supervisors, large supervisors sometimes, come and see me and say, well, you know, uh, there is this, this thing in the regulation. Uh, 
we don't know whether we should do like this or like that. I said, well, yeah. I mean, because that's on purpose, actually, because I don't know either. That all depends uh, what's the problem, what's the structure of your market, what have you. And the reason why it's like this is to give you freedom to interpret the regulation the way that suits best the consequences, the, the structure of your market. Ah, oh, yeah, 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 but I mean, that's hugely complicated. I mean, we, 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 we have a huge legal risk that we want you to clarify. And occasionally, we do clarify. And then, invariably, I get the same supervisor coming back to me and say, oh, you remove all my discretion. <laughs> I don't know how to, to combine the two, frankly. Even you have a, a standard that is reasonable, but sufficiently loose, so that there is a discretion for a supervisor, which is my model. And I don't think regulators should try to do the job of supervisors because that never works. Let me give you an example. We have uh, this equivalence with the US on CCPs in EMEA. It took four years to negotiate. And after three years, the only, the only problem left was the level of margins. And they had one day gross, if I remember. We had two days net. Uh, we discussed, we discussed, we discussed. And in the end of the day, we would probably have settled on something. Except that for the CFTC to change the margining policy, it takes them to gather the commissioners and decide. Boom, they meet at 9, at 9.30 it's over. For me to, sell, to change the margining policy, it takes me to make an amendment to EMEA, send it to the Council of Parliament, and maybe two years after we have something different. <laughs> uh, and that's what happens when you don't empower your supervisors. You don't allow them to flexibly adapt to market situation. Now transpose this into the fintech world. Uh, one of the things we will need to do is we'll need to explain to the Parliament and the Council that they need to be a bit more empowering with the institutions that they have created and that actually are made of a collection of their own national supervisors, rather than trying to prescribe in a very tightened way how they should act, because we will invariably get it wrong. Well, maybe you get it right at the time, best case scenario, you draft it. But six months after, the markets have moved. And six months after, you're still negotiating, of course. So let alone two years after. And your ability to change uh, uh, in a, any meaningful time frame is zero. So there are a number of challenges for Europe to matter in terms of financial innovation. And it's all about, for everybody in the world, it's all about uh, uh, a trade-off between allowing innovation to flourish, which has a number of benefits in terms of efficiency, cost-cutting, etc., and of course, controlling for your risk. In the specific European setting, this is specifically challenging. And the more quickly things go, and with innovation, it goes very, very quickly, and the more inadapted the way we do business at regulatory and supervisory level is. So this is something that we are preoccupied about in the uh, Commission. This is something a number of member states, uh, the more flexible ones, are preoccupied about as well, but there are considerable residences uh, in the parliament and in, in a number of other member states. So there is a huge advocacy work to be done. We will do our bit, uh, but I think the, the, the sector should do its bit as well, because the consequences of losing that battle are huge. I mean, uh, because it's exactly like in sustainability. The best innovation centers in the world will become the standard setter. And we will become techers. If we're happy with this, we just have to continue uh, uh, as, as we are. So this is why we promote a number of things like innovation facilitators, etc., etc. Uh, we're very happy with the work that... Uh, that uh, the ESAs are doing in the area of uh, cyber risk. Uh, but we need to be 
at the same time, a lot more joined up and a lot more empowering in the future if we want to matter uh, in terms of innovation on private finance. Thank you. Thank you very much.